Martin. Right, so welcome everybody. Welcome to our Open Education Week webinar, which is a special preview of OER 18, open to all, and we're all so looking forward to it. It's, it's looking like being the most exciting um, OER conference to date. They just get better and better. Um, but I know that we've seen a lot of uh, participants as well uh, who are students, and that's something that we in Open Education have been looking, looking for for a little while. So it's great to have uh, everybody and probably the people who are the most engaged and involved in um, education participating and sharing uh, the importance of open education. So we are absolutely delighted to be able to uh, have our three keynotes with us, Lorna, Momodu and David, and to tell us a little bit about, uh, just to give us a little bit of an insight into uh, where their thinking is for their keynotes um, in Bristol in April. And to give us a little teaser of the event, many of us, I know, will meet there, but perhaps not everybody, and perhaps not everybody's going to be able to. But we're fortunate as well to be having in this year's OER 18 lots of virtual opportunities as well to connect. So virtually connecting will be there as well. So good to have lots and lots of people um, joining us here in the room, but even great, even greater that as well, we can record this and capture it and people who couldn't make it today will be able to watch um, remotely when they've got a moment. So if you're having difficulties, any technical difficulties, please feel free to send the moderators a message and do check out the settings wheel. So if you open the bottom right hand corner panel, that pink button, you'll see a little wheel and you can actually check your setup with your camera and microphone if you're having any technical issues. Um, so please feel free to explore those and get some help if you're having problems hearing us. I'm going to just give, give a very brief introduction to who we are in terms of the Open Education SIG, Special Interest Group. So uh, and to our main mission. So I'm going to share in the chat a link to the community. Um, if you haven't found it already, you probably found it for the um, uh, the event today. But that is the site uh, there, the community site. And you, you can see there you've got the webinar uh, resources there from previous sessions as well to review. And we also have a blog area and we have um, a set of forums as well for people to uh, interact on. And our central mission is really to make sure that as many people as possible have as few barriers as possible to education. So uh, we've been looking at all areas of open and we've had a series of webinars in recent uh, uh, months around the, the various sort of manifestations of open uh, run by people such as Wikipedia, um, talking about our open values as well with people such as um, Martin Dujiemus from Doodle, from, from Moodle. <laughs> um, and uh, we've also looked at some of the great successes in the open education movement. Um, so things like Geo for All. Um, so we try to showcase these sorts of activities to inspire each other, but also to network and make sure that uh, those people who share our interest and our support for open education can connect and increase their impact uh, on their respective communities and in their different countries and contexts. And I see we've got a really international group of people here today joining us, which is great to see. Thank you. Lovely to see you, Helen. And great to see that Helen Crump, actually, you did manage to get in in the end. <laughs> You've overcome those technical problems, which is brilliant. Great. Well, if you didn't know already, it is Open Education Week. And this is just one of many, many events going on around the world um, that really give us an opportunity to showcase what we value. Um, so we're participating. And what we're going to what we're going to do today, as I said, is to meet the keynote speakers from OER 18 and to hear from them and to find out a little bit about their contexts and their take on open education and 
I've got to because I'm a huge fan do a quick shout out to Jim Luke who I've just seen turn up hello <laughs> how exciting what a great what a great list of people we've got in the room today so Lorna can I ask you just to pop your webcam on and your mic and we'll check that uh, you're sure, ready no to go can you hear me everyone yeah we're we're hearing you fine that's great I'll keep an eye on the chat and uh, looking yeah. forward to hearing from you Okay, great. Well, um, thank you very much um, for inviting me to uh, come along and speak to you today. And uh, uh, thank you also for the invitation to present a keynote um, at the conference. Uh, it's always a huge privilege to be um, invited to, to keynote at any event. Um, but I'm hugely um, delighted to be presenting um, at the OER conference because I've actually got a long involvement uh, with the OER conferences and one of the things I want to do is to look at how the conference has changed over the years and also how it's influences, influenced and reflects my own development as an open educational practitioner. So just a very brief introduction. Um, I currently work at uh, the University of Edinburgh um, with the Open Educational Resources Services within um, the Information Services Group. Um, but I work from home in Glasgow part of the time as well. So um, I'm actually uh, speaking to you from Glasgow today. Um, I've been involved in education technology since about 1997 um, and for a lot of that time I have actually been working in the domain of um, open standards, open technology um, and laterally open educational resources. And I first um, I think started working in the domain of open education round about um, 2009. Um, and at the time, I worked for um, uh, the Joint Information System Committee, JISCS, um, one of their services, um, the Centre for Education Technology and Interoperability Standards, um, or CETAS as it was known. And our role within the JISC was to provide the technology strategy um, for the JISC development programmes and also to represent um, higher education on a wide range of um, international standards bodies. Um, round about uh, 2009, um, JISC, along with the Higher Education Academy, um, launched a hefty funded programme called the UK Open Educational Resources Programme. Um, and uh, round about this time uh, was when the OER conference at first kicked off. So the first OER conference took place at the University of Cambridge in uh, 2010, I believe. Um, and I think I've been to every single one of the OER conferences since then. So I very much see it as my conference. This is where I meet uh, my peers and the people that I learn from uh, and the people who have influenced uh, my practice. Um, and it's been really interesting to see how the conference has changed and evolved over the years um, as our understanding of open education and OER has changed and developed um, over that time. When the conference first kicked off, like I said, it was very much associated with the UK OER programme. And although that programme wasn't fundamentally about technology, the early conferences were in some way focused on how technology could be used to support OER and the dissemination of open educational resources. So there was quite a pronounced uh, technology strand in the conference. Um, and from my perspective, um, I was very much focused on technology to support um, open education and open educational resources at that time. It is quite interesting that um, there was still a very broad definition um, or a broad understanding of what constituted open educational resources at that time. Um, we weren't so much concerned about nailing down what was or was not an open educational resource. It was more about how we can harness technology um, to share. Um, sorry, are you losing my connection just now? Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Yep, I just lost got. Uh, uh, yeah. We lost the video. Um, I got a poor bandwidth connection. I'll turn my video. Back. 
Let's see if it persists. I can just turn it off again. I don't think that's going to play. Um, I'll just keep going without video. Um, so this is very much where the, the conference came from, um, where this book is very much on resources and how communities could support each other to share and develop resources. Now, the UK OER programme ran for, um, it was a three-year programme um, with uh, about a year planning before that. And as I said, the conference was very much associated with that programme. And there was um, a lot of discussion at the time about whether um, the open education community in the UK would continue to thrive and develop once the funding for that programme dried up. And a lot of people predicted that when the programme came to an end, the conference would come to an end as well. But that wasn't what happened. Uh, the conference continued to thrive. Um, for a number of years, um, it was supported purely by the, um, the open education community in the UK. And it was interesting to see how um, ideas of open education changed around that time. The focus of the conference very much shifted away from uh, looking purely at resources and started to expand its remit to draw in um, open practice, open pedagogy. In 2012, of course, we saw the advent of MOOCs and for a while everything was about MOOCs and OER kind of like very much went on the back burner of it. Um, and then, of course, um, ALT got involved in supporting the conference. And I think it's really important to um, acknowledge the role that ALT have played um, in supporting the conference, uh, because I think it's 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 very much down through um, their um, efforts that the conference has become just as international and diverse as it is now. Um, UK OER did start off as very much a UK focused conference, but it really has expanded its remit. Um, and it's also, I think, one of the things that has been uh, really encouraging about the conference is that it has really embraced um, this idea of continually critiquing how we understand open education and how we understand open educational resources. Um, and certainly, I think it was in 2014, OER for 2014, um, the co-chairs actually sought to um, look at um, different definitions of what OER might mean. Um, so moving away from the whole idea of, of resources altogether, they actually posed the question, well, what else could that R in OER stand for if we're no longer concerned about resources? And there was some very interesting discussions about that around that time. And while I really applaud the, um, the conference for being willing to always critique and reconceptualize what open education means. I think we do have to be careful that we don't lose sight of some of the fundamentals of open education. And I would argue very, very strongly that one of those fundamentals is that publicly funded educational resources should be freely and openly available. And I think there is sometimes uh, a feeling that um, as we move into exploring what it means to be an open educational practitioner, what open pedagogy means, all these very nuanced um, aspects and areas of open education, there is sometimes a bit of a feeling that open educational resources are done and dusted, that we've dealt with them and that we can move on to other things. But I would argue very strongly that that's not the case and that we still need to do a lot of work in the area of open educational resources, uh, because I think far too few of our publicly funded educational materials are available to the public under open license. And that's something that I think um, I would very much like to see us refocus on. And that's not to say that we, we shouldn't also be looking at open practice and open pedagogy, etc., because these are all part of the wider um, open education landscape. So this is very much one of the themes that I want to look at in my keynote. And one of the things I think that has been very interesting is that those institutions um, that have really got behind OER in a sustainable way are institutions and organisations and individuals where um, the value proposition for OER 
really meet um, their personal mission or their institutional vision or indeed their organizational business models. And I think we can probably all think of organizations that really have embraced um, releasing and uh, supporting open educational resources, whether it's all themselves um, or with the Wikimedia Foundation and the various Wikimedia chapters around the world. Many of our cultural heritage institutions um, around the world are really supporting the dissemination of open knowledge, um, whether it's a Rijks Museum or um, the, the National Portrait Gallery here in the UK um, or the National Library of Scotland. Um, and some of our uh, educational institutions as well, uh, we're really seeing them supporting um, the release of open educational resources um, from an institutional perspective. And certainly within my institution, the University of Edinburgh, um, we have an open education policy within the university um, and the university really supports um, the use and the creation and the reuse of open educational resources because we see it as being squarely in line um, with our civic mission uh, because the University of Edinburgh is a, a civic university. Um, we believe that we have an important role to play to disseminate knowledge not just within the academic community but out with the acad academy uh, to the city, to Scotland and to beyond and supporting open educational resources is very much one way that we can do that. And I think one of the things that's important to understand is that the rationale for supporting OER will be very, very different um, for individual organisations and indeed for individual people. Um, and that we need to be able to accommodate um, and to be able to hear a wide range of voices uh, when we um, engage in open educational discourse. And I think one of these voices, one of the voices that has quite often not been present in our discourse has been the voice of the student. And that's one of the reasons uh, that I'm really, really encouraged um, that the theme of the conference this year um, is open for all uh, and the focus is very much on the learner. Now that's not to say that the conference has completely neglected the voice of the student, far from it. Um, in fact, we have actually had two keynotes at the OER conference um, over the years from um, the National Union of Students. But I think there is a lot more um, that we can do to encourage um, students to get involved with open education and to engage with open educational resources. Um, and one of the things I want to do in my keynote is to look at some examples from the University of Edinburgh uh, of how we have done that. Uh, because within our university, um, open education is very much led by the students. Our, pol our open education resources policy, um, the impetus for that came from the University of Edinburgh Student Association. Um, and I'm actually going to be joined at the conference this year um, by the um, vice president one of the vice presidents of the student union. And uh, what I'll be doing is uh, highlighting um, some of the ways that we engage um, students in open education at the university. Um, I'll also be accompanied by quite a few of my colleagues um, from the university who will be doing their own uh, papers and presentations and workshops um, about um, initiatives they're engaged in. And I don't want to steal their thunder too much. Um, but I will be, like I said, highlighting some of the things we do around the university to encourage that um, diversity of voices and to engage students in open education, um, including looking at our um, open content curation interns project. So I'm not going to say too much more about that um, at the moment. Um, you can hear a lot more about that at the conference um, if you're able to come along in person. Um, if you're not, then I hope you'll be able to join us remotely. Um, as Teresa said and as Viv said, um, the conference uh, does make uh, huge efforts to ensure that it really is an open conference and that even if you are unable to come and join us in Bristol, um, you will be able to participate in the conference remotely. Um, so I hope um, I'll look forward to um, seeing you one way or another um, in Bristol. And I'm going to stop there now and I'm very happy to take any um, comments or questions that you might have. That's fabulous, Lorna. As, as always, to be relied on for the, the most important and the most crucial um, discussions, because it's obviously been something um, that you've been very close to for a long time. And it's just fabulous to see how 
things are moving on and, and growing and how people are starting to pay attention um, to the open agenda. Um, we, we have a conference chair, Viv, in the room as well. Um, so Viv, can I invite you to um, say hi to everybody? Now we've got a room full of people and to welcome them and maybe encourage them to come along if they're not already planning to come along to OER 18. Oh, hi. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah, I mean, and that was an amazing preview, wasn't it? And I, Absolutely. It, I, and I just get a sense of how important it is to, you know, keep hold of the history and where we've come from um, and, you know, the work done along the way. So, yeah, we are so excited, David and myself, <laughs> about bringing this to Bristol and equally excited. I think this is a role model conference in terms of how to, as Lorna said, open it up through the use of social media and all of Martin Hawkes' amazing wizardry and the old, old amazing wizardry, that's, I think, an even growing, ex more exciting element too that other conferences hopefully can learn from. So yeah, thanks to everyone for popping in today. And um, as you can see, if you follow the conference hashtag, it's an almost year round um, ongoing <laughs> discussion um, of, of some of the points Lorna raised, which again, I think is just a phenomenon reflecting the passion and the recognised importance of open education in the UK. And if anyone caught Radio 4 today, <laughs> there were two um, quite senior people from, uh, I don't know, the sort of Department of Education discussing schools, the need for textbooks, the high cost of textbooks. And I was going, hello. Yes, <laughs> I know, just picked that up on Twitter. Just, yes. just go on to Twitter, you know, just, yeah. just do a Google search. And, you know, so I think there's really exciting work to be done and hopefully um, as a result of the conference and the, the amazing US conferences and all the work that our keynotes do, uh, you know, we can keep keep sort of pushing that. So thank you so much. I'll shut up now. <laughs> well, that's, thank you. Thank you very much for being ready to pop in and, and um, add that. Um, Momodo, I'm going to see whether your uh, microphone is working, if you could um, try that for me. just. Um, switch your mic on and maybe we can I'm here <laughs> wonderful you're here that's always that's always very comforting when you're chairing a webinar <laughs> I can see your name but I want to hear you that's wonderful so we'd like to turn turn the next 10 minutes over to you or so um, and hear more about your ideas for your keynote contribution to OER 18 and a little bit more perhaps about yourself so let the floor is yours. Okay, greetings everyone um, from Leicester. Thank you very much, um, Teresa, uh, for the invitation to Viv and also the whole team who've put this thing together. Um, a bit about myself. Uh, so I like to see myself as a, like a scholar activist. Um, um, I teach um, mainly on the social work, youth and community development programs here at the Montfort University in Leicester. Um, but I'm also involved a lot in, in a group uh, or an organization that I set up called Global Hands, which is a charity um, in, the, uh, in the Gambia and also a social enterprise. Uh, it is a social enterprise um, 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 in the UK here. So what we do a lot of is, 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 um, uh, is building capacity. But I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, I think I, I'm, I'm quite interested in linking in terms of this, my talk, starting from Kant's categorical imperative and, and, li and literally what actually motivates me uh, kind of like to do what I do. Um, uh, education uh, as a tool, um, you know, not only in terms of generating knowledge, but for me, in terms of solving uh, 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 some of the problems uh, that affects me due to my positionality, due to my situatedness. So um, I am part of where I come from. I'm a collection of my experiences that, and that imbues who I am and what I get up to. So education for me is a tool for, um, um, for social transformation. Uh, and I do not apologize for that. Um, in terms of um, this particular talk, um, there are things that I would like to bring up. For example, growing up, I read one of the classic books from Walter Rodney, which actually was about how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And I think something that was key from that book was about uh, uh, functional education versus literate education. 
uh, having the education that allows you to read and write, but not to be able to transform the problems of our society. Uh, so for me, developing that functional education is something that is very, very key. That's why in my work, uh, there's a lot of focus which are aligned, uh, uh, a lot of focus on, on functionality, on access, on relevance, um, which are aligned to OER objectives. And, and I guess that's why I was asked to, to, to share my thinking. So I think that's very, very important to contextualize uh, where I'm coming from, because like I said, my situatedness, um, my positionality impacts on what I do. Now, in terms of uh, global, I mean, so I am, I, I teach, I mean, I've been teaching in DMU for the past 13 years, and that's, that's my job. Um, and I think teaching is my job, is my passion, but my greater passion is working with global hands. Um, and I think um, we set it up, me and some of some students uh, and ex-students of the Montford University set up global hands to look at how, you know, we can contribute to public good and in building a better wall. So in Global Hands, we, we've got three main uh, objectives. Uh, one is that um, we look at international development. Uh, in January, I came back with um, 35, um, no, 45 students from three universities, Manchester Med, University of East London, and, and the Montford University. Um, and we were in the Gambia for about 12 days. Um, and we went there and we learned about globalization using an experiential approach. Uh, we learned about uh, development. We learned about cultural competence. Um, you know, we, we learned about a lot of things. Uh, but also the students were not there only as um, um, uh, for cultural tourism. They were there to contribute, to share knowledge. So whether it's about running joint workshops, taking part in a seminar, taking part in a run for Africa, taking part in a book launch, um, so that's part of, it's a reciprocal, mutual kind of like engagement that we're interested in because a lot of the young people, uh, a lot of the students and the staff from the UK universities were sharing their knowledge and their expertise. We had a student who, has, who, who was there, or actually two students who were doing one a master's, the other one a PhD student, and they were looking at how they could actually uh, develop uh, the off-grid kind of like power station that we've got there, which is linked to uh, an electric vehicle project that we, we that we're doing that I'll talk about later. So that's one of the things that we do on the international development. Um, so we work with a lot of universities, both in the UK and in the Gambia, to do this to exchange knowledge, to actually provoke consciousness, and also to decolonize the curriculum in a practical way. Because we're not only talking about people learning with their uh, with their heads, but also with their hearts. And sometimes that is very very difficult to conceptualize until and unless you're in a space that actually uh, kind of like allows that to happen. So international development, uh, we've built the second biggest library in the Gambia, um, and that was done by students mainly from uh, uh, Demon Ford University, from uh, the design of the building, working with the community, to the introduction of compressed art bricks. If you use a normal bag of cement, you can get possibly about 35 bricks from it. Um, if you actually, and we got the students to recite this and to develop this. If you use the compressed art, art, compressed art brick, which is more sustainable, instead of using seven wheelbarrows of sand, you only use one wheelbarrow of sand, and you possibly get about 10, 12 wheelbarrows of mud and a bag of cement. It's cheaper, it's environmentally friendlier. And this is the technology that our students here and our staff have been able to teach local young people in the village of Manduar to be able to build a hub that we've set up called the Manduar Development Hub. So there's a lot of exchange of knowledge, of experience, and getting our students to use their knowledge actually to create some of those things in a practical way. But we could talk about, so we built the second biggest library. Uh, we got our students, we got our staff as well from the library here to go in there, and we were thinking about how do we get, how do we source a system that doesn't require paying money. And I think they ended up with Ubuntu and installing it in all the computers and setting up other systems that uh, are based mainly uh, on the OER approach. Um, so it, it is quite interesting how we do that. Uh, the other bit that we do is education and public engagement. So, I mean, some of you might know about the, the pathway where uh, young people mainly from Sub-Saharan Africa are coming kind of like, um, 
uh, through Libya and trying to get through Europe via the Mediterranean. And a lot of them actually uh, die on the way. Some are sold into slavery for about $200. Some are actually uh, organ harvested. Organ harvested. Um, so it, it, there's some, some, some start, tragic stories. So we need a big, massive uh, public engagement campaign where we work with students. I mean, we don't have experts working with us in the traditional sense. We work with students and ordinary people and develop the skills, exchange knowledge, and set up a massive uh, public education campaign about pathway solutions and candle of hope, including songs, uh, documentaries, a run for Africa to develop, raise money to do these projects. So that's only one part of what we do in terms of education, public, uh, education and public engagement. We do seminars, we do conferences, uh, you know, we do projects that allow us to one, provoke consciousness and to support action. And then the third thing that we do uh, is promote certain perspectives. So we've got, we've set up a journal of critical silent studies and, and, and that is an open access journal, uh, which actually to be quite honest, over the last year or two has slowed down a little bit and we've got plans to revive it. But this is about promoting critical Southern voices. Uh, uh, the Suzo talks about some ways not being visible and credible to our way of thinking. And I think our journal does that. And we've also published about 12 books, some of them being used in the University of the Gambia as Cortex, until I actually, uh, uh, kind of when I was going to high school, um, I didn't have access to national history. I could tell you about Columbus and uh, Vasco da Gama, and I could tell you about the Plantagenets and Hawkins and all of these things, but I couldn't tell you my history as a young person growing up in the Gambia. And I think there's a, the art of literature and material that allows that to happen. So we use one day journal, not only in the Gambia, but for a lot of southern countries um, to actually uh, to challenge dominant configurations of ways of knowing and being. But also, uh, we kind of like ha have made some of those books available to the University of the Gambia, yeah. which is being used as core textbook for some of these things as well. So I think that was quite uh, important in what we do. But also, a lot of the work is done by us, my, myself, staff, and students, uh, without expectation of remuneration, just to make sure that we share this kind of orthodox perspective. So I will be sharing a lot more of these, uh, and we've got some really interesting projects going on right now in terms of uh, sharing technology. For example, we're working with a key, uh, one of the leading car manufacturers in Europe, and we are trying to set up the first solar powered taxi service in Africa. Uh, and we're trying to, we're in the process of setting up a living lab so that um, we would look at how we can develop uh, tractors that use solar power with local materials, local people, in collaboration with uh, international organizations uh, in Europe and staff. Um, uh, last week, we just sent the money. Uh, this compressed art technology I was talking about earlier, uh, to buy the machine is about $4,000, which actually places out of the reach of, of a lot of people who should be benefiting from it. So I've been working over the last six months with two young Gambian uh, engineers. One is civil, the other one is uh, uh, mechanic, uh, mechanical engineering. And they've designed this machine for $250, uh, which actually the prototype should be finished by next week. So by the time I come to the conference, I might be able to share it. Uh, and the idea is that we can find ways of reproducing that because that will have a massive impact because there's a lot of environmental degradation, uh, soil erosion, and because due to mainly uh, mining um, of the sun, uh, because there's been a boom since the last president who's been there for 22 years as a dictator left. There's been booming and interest in the country. So, I mean, we're hoping that um, uh, this will make a big difference. Um, we're also working on food processing. A significant percentage of mangoes actually rot because they don't have any packaging. And I've been working with some students and some people from here to transfer the technology so that we can do mango drying and processing some of the other food as well for storage. So in, in the conference, what am I going to do? I'm going to look at one, the sustainability of these projects because it comes at a cost and the reproduction comes at a cost. So how do you keep a model that is affordable, that is open access at the same time that is sustaining? Because otherwise you'll have to go to people every month or every year, uh, cap in hand, asking for money. So how do we develop these things? Uh, the other thing is like, 
you know, there's a, there's a question for moral philosophy. I mean, Kerry Young, one of the youth work uh, writers says that uh, youth work and to an extent community development is an exercise in moral philosophy. And it's about, I mean, it, we're supposed to generate these spaces where we ask essential question of self, who are we, what's our purpose? So, I mean, how do we do that? And how do we generate spaces in which people can be best versions of themselves? So that would be something that I want to talk about. But I also see uh, OER as a pedagogy uh, of disruption, you know, against structural violence and towards social justice. You know, that's what I'm about. I said that earlier about my situatedness, about my personality, and these are my stories from my experience. And uh, I want people to disagree with me. In fact, I'll be disappointed if, we, if they don't disagree with me and share counter narratives, and we can have this dialogue. So I'm hoping that um, I will, I'll be positioning OER as a pedagogy of disruption. But I think the other key bit I want to share as well is about students, staff, as co-producers in the whole process. We started Global Hands without a penny. Um, and we, we haven't received any major funding from anybody. We've been able to generate our own funding, do a little bit of the fundraising uh, to make things happen. Because with or without the help of others, we want to kind of like uh, uh, promote uh, uh, a better world, you know. So that so I mean that's just a tease of what kind of like um, um, kind of like um, what I intend thinking about um, uh, during the, the conference. And and I really hope that I will see most of you there. And then we will actually continue during the during the formal sessions and uh, during the uh, the breaks as well to have these conversations and to cross party life and to uh, to share better ways of doing things. That's brilliant, Mamodo. Thank you so much. And it's great to hear. And are you clearly in a room where there are other people behind you, but you've carried on. We've been able to hear you very well. And and people are expressing their uh, their uh, gratitude in the chat here. Um, there's so much to unpack in what you've um, teased us with there that we're really desperate now to come along and engage with you in the OER 18 conference. Thank so, you. Thank you very much. Lovely to hear from you. And so David, who was up at silly o'clock this morning in order to participate, thank you very much for that. We, we've had, we have three keynote speakers with us who are probably some of the busiest people ever. So, you know, I'm really grateful that you've managed to squeeze us in um, and do this preview. Um, David, could you just switch your mic on and we'll see that we've got your audio. Yes, good. well, it's good morning here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning indeed. Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And can we turn the floor over to you? Really keen to hear. I've been a, a very um, eager devourer of your blog for quite some time and I'm very keen to hear what uh, you're going to be talking to us about at OER 18. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, and and thank you for the invitation. I um, I have to admit, I really was floored and surprised uh, when the invitation came through, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and and participate at the conference with you. Um, you know, just in terms of a, a little personal introduction, um, I was a I was a full time faculty member for about a dozen years, teaching in educational technology programs. Um, and over that time, you know, really moved from being a full-time scholar to slowly becoming a more a full-time scholar, but really a part-time activist and uh, kind of outside the institution, working on the ground with folks on issues related to open education. And uh, about five years ago, finally made the the decision to flip that over and become more full-time in my kind of practitioner activism kind of work and more part-time in my scholarly role. And so now I find myself uh, in a full-time role at Lumen Learning, uh, where we essentially are focused uh, in the United States on community colleges and other institutions that uh, have open enrollment policies, the kinds of institutions here that serve um, you know, students who are academically at risk or underprepared. Uh, and whose faculty are also the least well supported in their use of technology and uh, ha have the least support and help in trying to adopt uh, new approaches. Um, 
doing that full time, but but still being part time at uh, Brigham Young University, where I was most recently full time and tenured. Uh, and also, uh, you know, a, a good chunk of my time now is spent in my uh, role at Creative Commons as the education fellow there. I'm currently teaching the the two beta sections of the CC certification, which has been over a year in development and is out in beta right now and should be open and available to the public uh, this coming April. So that's that's been really exciting to work on uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I want to say um, I want to say two things. I, first, I want to share I want to share a little personal story about my path into this work and then and then maybe get on to giving a, a preview of what I might talk about in the uh, keynote at the conference. In the in the mid 90s I was working as a university webmaster at my alma mater which is Marshall University in West Virginia here in the US. Um, I was working as webmaster I was teaching as an adjunct in the in the computer science department there teaching a, a class on configuring maintaining running web servers and teaching a class on on what we called e-business at the time at the local community college uh, and you know I can I had a I had an experience while I was working in that role as webmaster that really changed my life and set me on this path to doing this work in in uh, open education. Um, I was I, I remember it very clearly. I was sitting at my desk and working on uh, developing a JavaScript based calculator, a calculator that was going to go into a web page, and it seemed like such an innovative thing uh, at the time, uh, but. You know, as I was working on developing that calculator, I I had this realization, and it wasn't, I certainly wasn't the first person to understand this. I think probably millions of people had understood this before I did, but it was just a, a thought that came to me with a particular uh, kind of force and power, which was that when when you take something like a calculator and you put it online, you change its nature in a really important way. So I thought, you know, thought back to the elementary school that I had attended in West Virginia when I was growing up, and um, you know things like there being a limited number of calculators and kind of waiting your turn for those to work their way around the room so you might have the opportunity to use them. Uh, but when you take a calculator and you put it online, you you change its nature in a way that while the physical calculator can only be used by one person at a time and you have to wait. Mm -hmm your turn or kind of compete for access to it, uh, when that calculator goes online, it suddenly becomes usable by everyone, uh, at least by everyone who has access to a, a device and an internet connection. And that difference between the physical and the digital really just kind of hit me like, a, like the clouds parting and a beam of sunlight kind of coming down and shining on me. And it, you know, it was very vogue at, at that time to uh, to be really critical of Microsoft, and I remember thinking, you know, this is how, this is how you get Bill Gates' kind of money. You you you, know, you work and produce and develop a piece of software that um, you know that takes a lot of time and effort to build, but once it's built, then you can essentially make free copies of that and sell them to people for, you know, a hundred, ten, a hundred twenty, hundred fifty dollars. Uh, or more, it's kind of like printing money. That's that's how you really get rich. Um, is you know I can see the pathway to doing that in this kind of new emerging world of the internet. But at the same time, you know, the other thought that occurred to me was, you know, the other direction that this can go is that if we can figure out how to fund the development of things like educational materials one time. Uh, once they're funded, they can be used by anyone and everyone. There's no, you know, kind of additional cost of, of people coming in and accessing those. And, and that seemed, that realization that if we could get educational materials online, they could be uh, then made available for free to everyone who could get to a device and get to a connection um, seemed like something that was really important and something that was worth spending a career working on.
And it was after I had that realization that I decided to go back to graduate school and uh, got on the path that I'm on right now. Um, so I've been chasing this dream for, I don't know, 20, 21, 22 years now. Um, it, it's been a while, but I just share a little bit of that background to, uh, to it, it may be in response to, to the remarks that the other speakers today have, met, have made, to acknowledge that I really do, I, I fundamentally come at this from a resource perspective. Um, I, I think about it in those terms, and I think about how technology makes those resources more broadly available and creates and, and opens opportunities for folks. Um, so in terms of kind of giving a preview of what I might say at the conference, I'm in what in some ways is a, a really enviable uh, position. The, the, the conference organizers have asked me to come and, and, and not be, the, not be the, the typical kind of upbeat David that you might have heard before, but to, to be not quite contrary David, but certainly to spend some time saying things that might not be super popular, uh, that might be controversial, but that, um, that might be beneficial uh, for, for folks in the field to hear and think about and have some conversations about. I, um, I'm kind of sensitive to, to the fact that doing that online could, uh, could be harder than it will be to do face-to-face. -face. So I want to take something that I hope is maybe slightly controversial, but not too far out uh, on a limb, not too far away from the trunk, and talk about continuous improvement for just a moment. I, I think some of the most exciting work uh, for me uh, that, that I'm involved in right now is work around continuous improvement. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, one of the amazing things about open educational resources, um, I think regardless of whose definition you uh, kind of decide you like, is that those resources grant us permission to engage in a set of activities that we're generally not allowed to engage in. And among those activities are uh, revising, altering, adapting, improving, uh, updating, and remixing, creating mashups and pulling things together, c combining resources from across, uh, you know, from different sources into something new. So that's that's quite powerful that OER gives you permission to do those things, but. Um, it, it, while it grants you those permissions, it doesn't actually give you any clue about where to go uh, to exercise them, where where to focus in, and where to spend your time and where to spend your effort. You know, you you can change anything, but what should you change? Um, I think I think when you add to open educational resources the idea of learning analytics, I think there's something very very powerful here. And I don't mean I don't mean the kind of typical learning analytics that when, when I say learning analytics, your mind may jump <clears throat> to predictive models that are intended to identify students who are struggling in a class while there's still time to reach out to them and and support them and, and give them some additional help in ways that will help them be successful. I mean more of a more of a content facing uh, and assessment facing analytics, the kind of analytics that you can look at when uh, your assessments and activities that you ask students to engage in, and e even all the way down to the individual assessment items that you might use on an exam, are aligned with, uh, with some kind of goal statements or learning outcomes or, or competency statements. Um, and all of the OER that you're using in support of uh, preparing students to be successful in achieving uh, mastery in your course are also aligned to learning outcomes. When, and when you create that very fine-grained alignment from OER through to the different kinds of activities and assessments that you ask students to engage in, it gives you the opportunity to say, <clears throat> with, with some specificity, here I can see you know, students falling down uh, as they try to demonstrate mastery here in these specific outcomes. And I can trace back from that failure, you know, their inability to demonstrate mastery, I can trace back to the, uh, you know, to the, to the content, to the resources that were supposed to be preparing them for that. And that kind of analytics that, uh, that works to give you information about 
how successful your course design and your course resources are in supporting student learning can match up very nicely uh, with OER in order to enable continuous improvement. Um, on the one hand, while OER give us permission to make changes, but don't tell us where we might go to, to look for those, um, learning analytics tells us exact, can tell us exactly where to go to look for places in our courses where students are struggling, but doesn't grant us the permissions we might need uh, if we've adopted uh, some traditionally copyrighted material uh, to make those changes that we can see need to be made. So putting these two together, having learning analytics uh, tell us where we should go to target course improvements and having OER give us permission to actually make those improvements and re, uh, you know, put those back out in the field at, in terms of being new and updated OER and run through that cycle again where additional students use it, data flows back through, and we're able to improve the OER again on sometimes in very short uh, cycles. Uh, the idea that we can be very empirical about the improvements that we make to OER and that OER can be better semester after semester. E each time someone uses OER to support their learning, there's an opportunity for that OER to support their learning better uh, than it was able to support learning, learning for students in the previous semester. And I think that idea of, of being very empirically minded and getting better and better and being able to help students be more and more successful every term is really quite exciting though I acknowledge that um, it might be a little controversial because of, uh, because of issues around data. This, uh, you know, we, I, I don't know the degree to which our, our work at Lumen is, is known uh, in the UK and elsewhere, but, um, you know, to give you a sense of scale, we supported, we directly supported a little over 170,000 students last year, saved them about $15 million collectively, and um, had another 13 some million uh, unique visitors kind of on the website using the, the OER that, that we curate and publish there. Um, but it really is a, a really interesting opportunity to watch data flow across a larger kind of national group of students all using the same OER and a common set of assessments and be able to drive improvement of those OER and honestly drive improvement of the assessments as well um, as those data flow back through so that as more and more people get involved in the OER movement and pick up and start using this OER, um, they're able to better support their students over time. So I, I think that's, that's all that I'll say in terms of preview. I see we've got fewer than 10 minutes left uh, for some discussion. But thank you again for uh, the invitation to participate in this webinar and for the invitation to be with you at the conference. And a big thank you, David, as well, for uh, fitting us in at a funny time of the day as well. So thank you very much for that. Lovely to have a, a, a pragmatic um, and, and practitioner-based focus as well, because I think um, often when we think about open practice, we haven't quite really done enough to engage with what that really means. And, and I think that's uh, you know going to be an area that I hope we will continue to explore through OER 18 as well. So my goodness, the time has rushed and I've seen lots and lots of uh, conversations going on through Twitter. And I know that this webinar will really just be um, a, a provocation. It gets people thinking and talking, and I know that people will, who haven't been able to join us in the room today will also uh, visit the webinar and uh, contribute to the discussion. So I want to make it really clear where those discussions can take place and can and do take place. Uh, there is a GISC mail list for the Open Ed SIG uh, that is open for anybody to join. On Twitter, the Open Ed SIG uh, as well as the OER18 hashtag is being used. So please do continue those conversations. Um, we have um, a, an Open Ed SIG community space. And I'll just pop the link for that into the chat as well. Um, where the conversations do indeed continue. Um, when we put the focus on to OER 18 and the conference coming in in a very short while now, um, getting closer all the time, um, there has been a fabulous innovation that's happened on the OER 18 um, 
website and this was again community driven which all the best things are um, the suggestion that we should uh, crowdsource images to use to um, promote OER 18 uh, and that's actually on the website this is a, a lovely way to actually have our um, images shared and to repurpose and reuse them to spread the word so do have a, a take the time to explore that um, OER website and to upload your themes with the, the kind of um, the color scheme that we've looked at for OER 18 is correct me if I'm wrong here it is black and white and gold so yeah your your um, images are very gratefully received there and they're looking good up on the OER 18 website and obviously we couldn't have organized this webinar today without the support and help <laughs> the support and help of alt and uh, the fact that they provide us very helpfully with this online room to capture the webinar yes Anna we have a color scheme <laughs> just you know when you're picking out your clothes to come you just have to think this through <laughs> and uh, so big thanks to Alt and to our moderators from Alt and to Maren and Martin and Tom who are here in the room for all their support. And yes, virtual flyers are welcome. That's Martin's wizardry that's put together the um, OER 18 photo sharing site. So yeah, please, please do take advantage of it and uh, add your images. There's been a great one added just recently, I think based on a Banksy, which is um, perfect for for a bristol conference many thanks to all of you for coming i do hope you will continue in, to engage with the open ed uh, sig and take a look at some of the past webinars as well where we've got lots of information um, about other activities that are going on in the world of open to familiarize yourself with so please come and explore those and contact us using the channels that i've already outlined but thank you all very much and a big thank you to all our keynotes and I think we'll be able to find an applause. There we go. We've got an applause emoticon in the chat there that we can send along. Big thanks to um, Lorna and to Mamodu and to uh, David for your contributions. Really looking forward to April and to the conference. I have been checking the chat for questions, but I haven't actually seen any. So if you've got a burning question, do use those um, channels that we've mentioned before, and we'll make sure that uh, we connect you with relevant people. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, we will have to sign off now. I have to go and teach, and I'm sure other people have other things to do too. But thank you all very much for coming. I'll switch the recording off.